morning, good afternoon rather. Uh, welcome to Condo Insider. Uh, this is the show about association living and because uh, about 30% of the people who live in the state of Hawaii live in condominiums, we hope we have uh, uh, subjects of interest that are, uh, would be interest, interesting to the people who are watching our show. And I have today with me uh, a good friend and colleague, Richard Port, uh, who's been very active in condo legislation and uh, advocating for owners' rights. Richard, can you tell us about how you got involved with the uh, advocating for condo owners? Well, I've lived in a condominium since 1974. Mm -hmm. And the first few years, I was busy with uh, my life, you know, my work. But around 1981, I decided, well, I didn't like particularly all the things that were going on, so I decided to get on the board. And with the exception of about three years since 1981, I've been on the uh, board of directors at my condominium. Uh, and so that's been, that's almost 35, over 35 years. That's correct. Oh, yeah. okay. And uh, basically, uh, uh, I started going up to the legislature uh, asking for changes to be made to the condo law. And um, in some cases, I was successful. And you did serve on something called a blue ribbon panel? I did. And, and that's, that's, a, that's a, 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 a volunteer organization that's established by the State of Hawaii Real Estate Commission, which is the uh, agency that has oversight over condominiums. Yes, and it's a means of uh, making changes, so it's a, it's a good thing. And so what, what types of things did you do on the condo, on, on the uh, Blue Ribbon panel? Well, the, the, the two, originally when condom condominiums were established by the legislature back in 1960s, uh, there were two real, uh, in, as far as management was concerned, was elections of boards of directors for condominiums, and secondly, uh, uh, information that uh, owners were entitled to. So everything, almost everything that has changed since then has related somehow to improving the election process, making it fairer, and uh, providing uh, more and more information uh, to owners uh, that they need to know in helping them to elect directors. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I'm, I, I feel that uh, the, the laws have improved a lot since that time. There's always room for some marginal uh, improvements, but the laws are pretty good. It's the enforcement, uh, and I think that's what we're going to be talking about uh, today. It's, uh, it's being able to um, uh, make sure that uh, the laws are being faithful, fa faithfully upheld. And, you know, one of the, the, our topic today, we're going to be talking about dispute resolution. So dispute resolution means that we're talking about trying to resolve disputes between condo owners and their boards or their property managers or even between owners yeah. or maybe between board members and their boards but in other words disputes between people who live and work in the condominium community right right can well, you tell me how long uh this issue has been around well when you put a lot of people in a relatively small space there are going to be disputes. They may relate to noise or, uh, well, noise is always a big one, but it can be anything from smoking, or it can be a lot of things. Uh, as it relates to boards, uh, boards oftentimes uh, feel that they're doing the right thing uh, for the owners, but sometimes the owners dispute that, and uh, sometimes board members dispute it among themselves. So the effort has been made by the legislature, and you've played a major role in this, to uh, try to find ways to resolve uh, without having to go to court, or uh, worse, going to the legislature to get the laws changed. Can you uh, tell our audience what kind of disputes is it, is, is it that you know, need to be resolved? Well. Uh, as it relates, it, it's how money is spent sometimes, uh, trying to um, avoid uh, special assessments because there's not enough money in the reserves. We have reserve laws, but sometimes uh, uh, they may be uh, not as strong some, in some cases as they need to be. But 
in any event, there's usually dispute over maintenance fees and assessments and loans. Or maybe it's about enforcement of the oh, house yes. rules? Oh, sure. In fact, that's what I was kind of hinting at when I talked about noise uh, within the building. Or it might even be what hours the pool, pool should be open if there's a pool in the condominium. So it can be a wide range of things uh, that can suddenly make for a dispute. And, and why do you think there are disputes that need to be resolved? Well, I think really, it, uh, in, a, in a general way, I've answered that, because basically you put a lot of people in a relatively close, close quarters, and you set up a situation where you have actually a, a legislative body called a board of directors, which makes the laws, uh, enforces the laws, and uh, it's a lot of power. Boards have quite a bit of power uh -huh. in comparison to, let's say, a state legislature or, uh, or a city council. In fact, boards, boards of directors are kind of like a city council, uh, with the president of the board becoming sort of like the mayor or the first among equals. Mm -hmm. And, and that uh, produces uh, uh, some, you know, personalities can play a role. Uh, sometimes you get uh, wealthy uh, owners who move into a condominium and they, th they try to throw their weight around. So that could be one kind of thing. Or I uh, remember uh, uh, one uh, president who was a, a retired captain in the Navy. Now, a captain in the Navy uh, is you know, it, there's a lot of power to that. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, as board president, he tried to throw his weight around, <laughs> sometimes maybe a little too much. And so uh, when you, when you, I mean, I hear you're talking about people, you know, uh, maybe being uh, aggressive or maybe, you know, taking, uh, taking advantage of their power. I mean, it sounds like maybe there's not a whole lot of communication, and maybe oh, that's, that's one problem. of the reasons why there are we Absolutely. need to have dis these dispute resolution uh, mechanisms. And we would just spend a minute on uh, communication. Yeah. Uh, the, the, uh, the board generally has the power of communicating. They, they have newsletters that they can send out to the owners, and, uh, uh, and they should, by the way. They should be sending out information, especially if they know some big project is coming out, uh, coming up the, uh, at the condominium. They really need to give uh, owners some advance uh, notice of that mm -hmm. uh, and they have to remind owners of uh, some without making it a scolding uh, they they need to remind uh, owners of some of the important rules uh, like parking in your own stall rather than somebody else's stall or overstaying your parking in uh, in, in a place uh, it's designed for moving in and out of a building so whatever that is uh, communication is terribly important and, and uh, I know you and I have, you know, gone to the legislature, you know, quite a bit. And, you know, what I, I think you will agree with me, what we've seen almost every year, there's always some type of bill that a legislator introduces because he has, he or she has gotten con complaints from their constituents right. about boards of directors right. who aren't communicating. Right. That's why you have bills that seek term limits, right? Yep. Because they, people think that if you limit the, the, the time that people can sit, sit on a board, that somehow, magically, the communications are going to get better. Yeah. It's not that simple, of course. Uh, but th those bills always happen. Absolutely. Right. What other types of uh, legislative action uh, happens because of this failure to communicate or trying to resolve disputes? Most bills uh, re revolve around either the access to information or the elections. So that means that a, a unit owner wants some information, like what? You might want uh, a contract that's been signed for a million dollars. It's already approved contract, been approved by the board, and they want a copy. They're actually entitled to a copy as long as it's uh, as long as it's uh, closed. In other words, that the uh, that the, the contract has been approved. Uh, obviously, if the contract is uh, there's multiple uh, contractors trying to get a contract, that's not the time to provide owners with the contract because they're still trying to resolve which 
company to select. But owners should be able to get a contract after it's signed. Why would they want to look at a contract? Well, they may want to find out uh, uh, what the uh, specifics of the work that is to be done, especially if it's a big contract. And they see, maybe they see as the, as the um, work is being accomplished, they see some strange things happening and they're wondering, was that part of the contract? So uh, it it's, should be automatic that they can get a copy of the, the contract. What other types of uh, information do owners usually want to get? Mostly it has to do with financial, uh, either general ledgers or uh, monthly financials. Uh, monthly financials has become somewhat less of a problem because um, a lot of condos now have websites and they put the, the, that information on the website. In fact, uh, communication has improved over the last two or three years in a lot of condominiums because a lot of them do put up on the website the minutes of meetings. That, that's another thing. They may, want, they may simply want the minutes of the meeting so they know who voted for or who voted against uh, something. That helps them when they decide later on who they want to vote for for re-election or future elections. And, and isn't it true that you know, the, some of the complaints you've heard is that people, owners who go to their boards can't even get board minutes? Yeah. And, you know, it was very common for that to be a problem 10 years ago and even maybe five years ago. Uh, it's, a, it's a given. They're entitled to that information. It says so in the state laws. Uh, and we're probably going to get into what do you do when you can't get minutes or you can't get financial statements. That's where the real problem comes in. And, and those are the issues that need to be refined. Okay. And um, other than, you know, uh, let, let's just go to, well, you know, the legislature did enact um, dispute resolution. They allowed for mediation, and then if you can't resolve it in mediation, you can go to arbitration. And th there have been other uh, attempts to try to uh, mediate disputes. Do, do you remember one about the condo court? Oh, yeah. Uh Actually, let's go a little further back and say, look, initially there was the uh, straight mediation, and if that didn't work, you could go to arbitration or you could go to court. And a court is very expensive, and also the court really prefers not to have to deal with these little disputes in what they perceive often as little disputes, although they can be big disputes within the condominium. Yes. So the, the, the courts would like to keep all of that stuff out of the courts. And so uh, they were, there was a what we called a condo court. And uh, that, uh, well, I think you would be better able to describe the reason, what happened in, in that case. But uh, we've come, the most recent stage is uh, uh, the quali qualitative uh, mediation. Evaluative. Eva evaluative me mediation. Right. Yeah. You but, might want to mention what happened on the condo court. Right. Okay, uh, well, we have, we're coming up to, to the break right now, so we're going to uh, take a few minutes, and, uh, and we will be back after Great. the break. Hello, this is Martin Despang. I want to get you get excited about my new show, which is Humane Architecture for Hawaii and Beyond. We're going to broadcast on Tuesdays, 5 p.m. here on uh, Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha everyone, I hope you've been watching ThinkTech Hawaii, but I'm here to invite you to watch me on Viva Hawaii every Monday at 3 p.m. I'm waiting for you. Mahalo. Hi, I'm Chris Leatham with The Economy and You, and I'd like to invite you each week to come watch my show each Wednesday at 3 p.m. Hello, I'm Marianne Sasaki. Welcome to ThinkTech Hawaii, where some of the most interesting conversations in Honolulu go on. I have a show on Wednesdays from 1 to 2 called Life in the Law, where we discuss legal issues, politics, governmental topics, and a whole host of issues. I hope you'll join me. Okay, we're back. Uh, we were talking about uh, uh, dispute resolution and how come uh, we can't seem to uh, get some type of resolution for these disputes 
between condo owners and their boards, which have been uh, ongoing for as many years as you and I have been involved in the legislature. And the legislature has tried uh, very many times to resolve it. And I think before the break, we were talking about condo court. And condo court, when, when, when the whole concept started off, I think it was John Morris, who was the first condo specialist, who came up with the, who, who found the idea. Somewhere in New Zealand, they were doing it. And they used something like a small claims court here but it was a judiciary system, and people would just go and file their $25, and it would be a one-page complaint, and you would get your day in court, but you wouldn't, it wasn't subject to appeal. And you would tell your story to a judge, there were no rules of evidence, the judge made a ruling, and that was it. And that's what we kind of envisioned. Do you remember all the trouble we had trying to get it through? Yeah. And then we couldn't get the judiciary to... Uh, basically adopt it, we ended up with the DCCA administrative hearing system. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think that was kind of like a disaster uh, because it, it just uh, uh, resulted in, in, in like a mini court. I mean, you had lawyers and you had appeals and, and you had people who really didn't understand condominiums and who weren't really judges making these decisions. So it was not a good result. And what happened well, one of the things that happened uh, is that a lot of times boards would refuse to participate. Right. In fact, that's one of the problems, isn't it? Yes, it is. Trying to get the parties into the same room to yes. resolve the disputes. Yeah, and the whole, and, and I know somebody asked me once, why is this important? And it's important that we have a system where these things are resolved quickly and cheaply Absolutely. because everybody lives together in this condominium and that, you know, that means that, you know, it festers. If it's not resolved quickly, then you have neighbors talking to neighbors, and then you, you develop factions. Right. And, and, and it just becomes a mess. And then, and then if it, you can't resolve it in mediation, you get to arbitration, you get to litigation, and then you got attorney's fees. And it's very expensive. Very expensive. For, for what should be able to be resolved at a lower level. Yes. Now, um... And, and, and uh, so the condo court didn't work. It, 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 it died. It died. And then we came up with evaluative mediation. And evaluative, me can you explain to us what evaluative well, mediation? Well, initially, I didn't think that was going to work either. Uh, uh, but it, it seems to me it has real promise. Uh, but I think uh, you're probably better off to explaining how that works. And that's where b both people uh, uh, show up the own homeowner and the condo board and you get a retired judge who listens to both sides and basically says you have a good case or you have a bad case and uh, and then usually it's it is resolved but that's only been in effect since January uh, July of last year yeah and at least if you know that you have a good case if if this retired judge says yeah you probably would uh, prevail th then uh, the other side and tells the other side, you know, uh, this is not a good case for you. Then there can be an effort to try to resolve the dispute, or just let the dispute go away. But the problem is, is you got to get both people in the same room. Oh, that's true, absolutely, and that's still a problem. Right. Even though the statute says shall, mm -hmm. the mediation statute says thou shall mediate. But then, because there is no, uh, there are no sanctions. And, and Richard and I, Richard Emery, who is my co-host on this show, you know, we vowed to go to the legislature to put teeth into that mediation statute. Yeah, at least something that, that uh, show, you know, at least it'll be a little bit of a slap on the wrist uh, if they don't uh, participate. And, you know, the, two, two things that have been suggested to, to us about it. One is to say, to add into the statute, that if you don't show up for the mediation, Whatever the other side is claiming is, is you know, he, he, that person wins by default mm -hmm. if you don't show up. That seems reasonable. Right? And if you want to set aside the default, you have to have a good reason. And that's You have to explain too. why you fail to appear. Right. And, yeah. and so that's one. And, you know, with mediation, with evaluative mediation, each side pays $350. And you go and you have, uh, uh, and the state of Hawaii has contracted with uh, dispute prevention resolution and with two other commercial mediators. Mm -hmm. And they are trained mm -hmm. 
And so you're talking about people who are qualified and who have background, they know what evaluate, evaluative mediation is, and so they're going to do the process. The problem is trying to get people into the room. Yeah. And the second, the second uh, um, uh, sanction that somebody has suggested to us for the mediation statute is, is if you go to this mediation, if you don't show up, at the mediation. The next step under the statute for the dispute resolution process is arbitration. So if you don't show up for the mediation and you make the other side go to arbitration or to litigation, if you don't eventually prevail, you pay for all the other side's legal right. costs and legal fees from the time the process started. Yeah. That would be a sanction. In other words, the, the, the whole purpose of the sanction is to get the people into the room when the cost is only $350. Right, right. Right? Right. And, and to get, because... I, I'm all for, I'm in favor of both of those. Right, because if provisions. you get people into the room early on in the dispute, it's easier to resolve. If it festers for six months, seven months, eight months, by this time people are angry. And they're angry because the other side has not listened to them or expressed the desire to... Right. even try to resolve it and and they basically think well they don't care yeah right or, or or you know they they're so arrogant they they think that they don't have to participate i think the the opening statement you made 30 30 percent of people uh, are living in condominiums and uh that means that there's a lot of people affected by these disputes and uh it's it's a it's critical that we re find a way to at the lowest level possible to resolve disputes. And I think I told you before the show that I got a call today from somebody in Hawaii Kai, and they're an elderly couple in their 80s. Their issue is noise. Yeah. They live next door to some people who are noisy 24/7. Yeah. And and they have tried being good neighbors and yeah. taking cookies next door and trying to talk <laughs> to them and say, please, please, will you be quiet? I mean, because mm -hmm. we need to sleep and you, you're noisy all the time. And, you know, that didn't work. And uh, they're renters. And, and, and when they found out that, you know, the reason that they're staying there is because they, they didn't want to be penalized, this couple actually offered them $4,000 <laughs> to pay the rent so that they could go out and find a new place. And they, they decided they didn't want that. They wanted $20,000 <laughs> instead of... And so he, here's this elderly couple, and they're living with... And they complain to their board. Their board won't even write a letter to the unit owners yeah. to, to say, your neighbor is complaining about the noise. And there is a house rule. Every kind sure. of name has got a house rule right. about noise. Right, absolutely. Okay, so now they're at wit's end, so they decide they're going to sell their unit. And they hire a realtor. Mm. And the realtor comes and looks at the unit. It's a nice building in Hawaii Kai. And the realtor just says, you've got a beautiful unit, but I can't sell this. It's too noisy. Yeah. And nobody's going to buy it. Yeah. And they showed me the, a letter from the realtor telling them that their unit is too noisy and they can't sell it. Yeah. And, 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 you know, they have their, the, 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 last, the call I got today is, can you refer us to a lawyer because we're going to sue our board? Oh, so that's, that's where we are with the, yeah, you know. No, so it, it's, it's very important that we try to get uh, the legislature this year to tighten up uh, the law and try to encourage boards and owners to resolve these uh, disputes. Well, you've heard this, this year they tried an ombudsman bill, and this is not the first time. Sure. And, and you know what an ombudsman bill yes. is. They, the, the bill basically, I mean, it, it varies. I mean, one year it was somebody in the Attorney General's office. This time it's somebody in the DCCA. Yeah. But it's basically a bureaucrat yeah. who, who people make complaints to. And then that yeah. person uses the resources of the state of Hawaii, basically coming from the Condo Education Fund. I, which think, we, I think really the, the, we would all prefer to, to handle this at the lowest possible level. But maybe what we need to do is to say, look, if we can't get boards and owners to uh, come to come up with a process that's fair, that maybe we're going to end up having to resort to an ombudsman or or 
somebody in the uh, Department of Commerce and Consumer Affairs who takes a little more proactive stance. Uh, I'm not saying that that's the answer, but I'm, what I'm basically saying is we have to, to re over the next few years, to resolve as much of this as possible. Because where it is today, there's just too many disputes going on between boards and their condo owners and condo owners among themselves. And, and that's probably wasted energy when they could be concentrating on trying to deal with the issues that affect the repair and maintenance of the building. Absolutely. Right? Rather than dealing Absolutely. with people who are unhappy because they think that the board is not dealing with their issues. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, you know, with an ombudsman bill, um, what would you think of a voluntary, of a, of a, instead of having a state official, having people in the industry, like retired property managers or even somebody like you, to, to volunteer, you know, to be an ombudsman. That way, you know, we're not using state resources. We're using like right. a volunteer, like, a, like the neighborhood justice system who do, yeah. who do mediations. And basically letting people know what their rights are and what their rights are not. Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, yeah, you're, you're, I can see uh, uh, maybe the example I was trying to use earlier. Uh, if you're trying to get a contract that's already signed, the board should be told, hey, that's what the provision in the law is. On the other hand, if they're trying to get the three bids and they're not on the board, that information is not necessarily something that they should have. It's, it, that's what you have the board for. The board mm -hmm. is elected by the owners. Uh, so while uh, I uh, uh, agree that uh, there are some things that uh, owners should actually be able to receive, I think there are other things that uh, the purview of the board of directors. Okay, well, we're running out of time, but I guess, I mean, this is probably not going to be the end of this discussion because, it, you know, as, as you and I know, for all the years we've spent in the legislature, this one always comes up. This issue never seems to go away to the satisfaction of the unit owners. Well, I shouldn't let this time go by without congratulating you. You don't get paid for any of this work that you do. <laughs> it's all voluntary uh, for, is it 30 years? It's, anyway, it's a long time that you've been involved. But you have been my, my, <laughs> my buddy in the legislature yeah. <laughs> for all those many years, so <laughs> you need to be congratulated too. Thank you very much, though, for spending time uh, with us. Uh, and um, and uh, next week, we're going to be talking about issues relating to aging in place. So uh, I hope that uh, you will join us uh, at that time.